If you and your best friends were trapped inside of a high-rise apartment building that was suddenly overrun by a swarm of deadly alien invaders, what would you do? This kid Moses and his bruvs think that they own the block, but these intergalactic apes are about to turn their whole neighborhood into a death trap, and no one is coming to save them. It looks like the tea and crumpets are going to have to wait, because we're going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, <laughs> and how to beat the killer space gorillas in Attack the Block. These kids are about to find out that they're not on the top of the food chain anymore. Late one night, while walking home to her apartment in South London, this woman, Sam, notices a group of troublesome youths blocking the path up ahead. Sensing danger, she tries to avoid them by quickly moving over to the other sidewalk, but it's too late. And before she can do anything about it, the kids are already circling her in. The group's leader, a young orphan named Moses, immediately orders her to hand over the valuables, but just as they're taking the last of her stuff, a meteor suddenly hurtles towards them out of the sky and crashes into the roof of a parked car just a few feet away. Seeing an opportunity, Sam gets up and books it out of there before the kids are back on their feet, but Moses tells the others to let her go, turning his attention to the destroyed car instead. After looking around to make sure that no one's watching, he decides to take a quick peek at what's inside. But this, as you can probably guess, was his biggest mistake. As he's digging through the glove box for anything worth stealing, he's suddenly attacked by a pale, eyeless, primate-like creature that lunges up at him from the floorboard. Moses quickly pulls back back, confused and terrified. But before he even has a chance to explain, the creature jumps out through the broken window and tackles him into the street, scratching at his face with its razor-sharp claws. Reaching into his pocket, he's able to hold the creature off by stabbing it in the side with his switchblade, and they watch as it turns to flee through a hole in the fence, escaping towards a nearby park. His friends are busy cracking jokes, but instead of finding it funny, Moses decides that he wants revenge. The boys chase the creature down until they eventually find it hiding in a shed on the nearby playground, and the group's second-in-command, Pest, quickly throws in some firecrackers as a distraction. With the creature cornered, Moses rushes in, followed by the other boys, and after a brief scuffle, they emerge victorious, holding the creature's limp body up on a stick. While they're still debating about what it could be, Pest realizes that it must be some kind of alien invader, and they begin to celebrate thinking that they've just killed the only one of its species for threatening their block. But what they don't realize is that it won't be long before more of them are on the way. Okay, it looks like this alien just crash landed on the wrong corner. These kids are the living embodiment of that tweet from a few years back that said, me and my friends would have killed E.T. with hammers. I can tell you that much. And honestly, I like their style. This thing traveled all the way across the galaxy just to get its ass whooped by the first group of teenagers that crossed its path. And that's exactly the kind of ruthless efficiency that games like Halo and Helldivers have been training us for. But now that the fight's over, we can take a step back and start to wrap our heads around what the hell even just happened here. Let's start by taking a look at the creature's characteristics and behaviors, and see if we can get a better picture of what exactly it is that they're up against. The first thing that you'd probably notice is its pale skin with patches of thin white fur, making it look like some kind of gray primate mixed with a xenomorph. It doesn't seem to have eyes, nostrils, or really even ears to speak of. Instead, the single and most prominent feature on its face is that massive jaw full of three inch long razor sharp fangs, which gives us an idea of what it might eat. People, yeah. Here on planet Earth, we can generally break down most of our animal species into three different categories based on their natural diets. These are herbivores, who eat plants, carnivores, who eat meat, and omnivores, who like to eat a bit of both. And in each case, their teeth are specifically adapted to fit their particular dietary needs. In herbivores, we expect to see broad, flat molars. Those are the teeth at the very back of your mouth, which help with grinding down and chewing on tough plant material. As for carnivores, they usually have sharp pointed canines for tearing through flesh, and their molars are either similar in shape or sometimes completely absent. So let's apply that same logic here. Based on our aliens' particular formidable set of grills with no plant grinding molars in sight, 
we can definitely guess that it's a carnivore, and most likely a predator, which would make it extremely dangerous to us meatbags for obvious reasons. But without any eyes, ears, or nostrils, how exactly would it go about finding its prey? Well, the answer to that might be shown in their second confrontation. When Moses and the boys have the creature cornered in the playground, they start their attack by using firecrackers to stun it, which seems to be very effective. Fireworks produce two main effects, a bright light and a loud bang. It's hard to imagine that Roger the alien here was stunned by the light, as it seems to be completely blind already. Instead, it was most likely the loud noise that threw it off. You may be wondering how this is possible since it doesn't have any ears, but we don't have to look any further than the creatures right here on our own planet to find the answer. Although many species like snakes, fish, and insects don't have external ears in the same way that you and I do, they instead have specifically adapted internal membranes that allow them to sense vibrations through the ground or water, helping them to detect prey and avoid potential threats. It's highly possible that this alien not only has a similar adaptation, but that these vibrations are the primary sense that it uses to interact with its surroundings. When Pest hit it with one of his bangers, he overwhelmed that sense, causing it to panic and open it up for an attack. This could also help to explain why it didn't attack Moses until he was making a lot of noise while messing around with the car's glove box. Speaking of the attack, let's discuss that for a minute. You might be willing to give this creature the benefit of the doubt and say that it was only acting in self-defense, but I wouldn't be so sure. If it were truly afraid for its life, you'd expect the creature to hold down a defensive position inside of the car, not lunge out and attack Moses after he'd already backed off. Adding to this, it only retreated after Moses had dealt it a significant wound and probably wouldn't have stopped until it killed him if he hadn't fought back. Overall, we can tell that it's not afraid of a fight, and going after it could have been a dangerous mistake if they hadn't gotten lucky with the firework trick. When it comes to offensive options, Marvin the Martian here may have left his ray gun at home, but it's still got those menacing teeth and razor-sharp claws. And those have been doing the damn thing here on Earth for the last 400 million years, making it a serious threat in close combat. The creature also moves quadruply, meaning that it runs on all fours, and this makes it both faster and more agile than any humans who are trying to get away from it, especially over short distances or through rough terrain. If you end up in a fight with one, then it looks like it's your best bet to just grab a weapon that allows you to attack while staying out of the reach of its claws and use loud noises like fireworks to stun it, which should open it up for a critical hit. Before any of that, though, the better choice is just to try to avoid a confrontation altogether. Now Moses and his crew probably aren't about to contact the police after having just mugged a woman, but if you ever find yourself as the first witness of an alien invasion, then the most uh, responsible thing to do would probably be to find a safe place and let the local authorities handle it instead. One big problem with giving an alien the traditional Earthling welcome is that they almost always have friends, which Moses and his buddies are just about to find out for themselves. What up, y'all? Are you tired of the same old drugstore fragrances? Do you dream of smelling like luxury but don't want to break the bank on a designer scent? Well, fret no more, because today I'm here to tell you about Scentbird the fragrance subscription service that's changing the game. For just $17 a month, Scentbird lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every single month. That's right, no more impulse buys or giant bottles collecting dust on your shelves. Scentbird offers total flexibility. You can even skip a month or cancel your subscription at any time, no questions asked. Plus, with over 700 perfumes and colognes to choose from, including iconic brands like Gucci, Prada, and Versace, and exciting indie labels like Skylar, Heretic, and Confessions of a Rebel, there's a perfect scent out there for everyone. I'm personally a huge fan of the Scents of Wood collection of fragrances. This month, I'm going with their Hinoki and Hinoki scent. It's subtle and eloquent. And funny story about this scent, every time I wear it, I get different comments from my friends. My personal favorite was when I gave my friend Piper a hug and she told me I smelled exactly like old books. Like, 
That's exactly what I'm going for. Now listen up, each month you get a 30 day supply of your chosen fragrance, allowing you to try it out properly before committing to a full size bottle, which in some cases could be up to 500 big ones. Like, come on, $500 in this economy? It's great to be able to try out a few before you commit. Could you imagine not being able to try on clothes or shoes before you commit to buying them? And you know me, I'm all about that drip. But what you can't see is that included in this meticulously curated look is a complimentary scent, and without Scentbird, I wouldn't have been able to complete the look. So ditch the department store fragrance counters and explore the world of luxury scents with Scentbird. Use my special coupon code BEAT for a whopping 55% off of your first month of Scentbird. That's just over $7 for a chance to discover your new signature fragrance. This incredible offer is only available in the USA and Canada, so don't miss out. Head over to Scentbird.com and start your fragrance journey today. Unsure of what to do with the alien now that they've caught it, the boys decide to bring it to the apartment of their friend Ron, a local degenerate and nature channel enthusiast, who might be able to give them some advice. Moses asks Ron if they can keep it in his safe room, thinking that it could be worth a lot of money, but Ron says that he'll have to ask his boss, Hi-Hats, first. After looking it over, Hi-Hats decides that he's not really interested in the alien himself, but he agrees to let the boys keep it there. On the condition that Moses works for him now. Moses knows that this could mean real trouble, but wanting to impress his friends, he quietly agrees to the deal. As he joins the others back in the living room, they suddenly notice dozens of more meteors just like the one that was carrying the alien crashing down to the streets outside. This can only mean one thing, more aliens ripe for the killing. And the boys quickly rush out into the hall, planning to grab whatever weapons that they can and take the fight to the extra extraterrestrials first. But what they don't realize is that these ones might be more than they can handle. It isn't long before they find another crash site down at the park. This time, something about this meteor is different. One of the boys, Dennis, shines the headlight from his pizza delivery scooter over the wreckage, and they quickly notice an imprint of the creature that used to be inside. To their surprise, this one looks much larger and meaner to the one that they managed to kill, but just then, Dennis's little dog, Pogo, spots something on the the playground and takes off running after it. Suddenly, the boys notice what the dog is after, but by then, it's already too late. As they watch from a distance, a dark black creature, similar to the first victim but twice its size, leaps down from the top of the playground and makes short work of poor Pogo before turning its attention on them. From the darkness, all that they can see is the alien's radioactive blue jaws open up as it lets out a high-pitched roar in their direction, and they quickly turn to make a beeline back for the apartments, realizing that for once, there's something on the block that's even more dangerous than they are. Okay, I guess this means that Moses and the boys have officially just met the reinforcements, but this one looks like a little more than they can handle. They might have bitten off a bit more than they can chew this time, so let's break down the encounter to see what we can learn about these new creatures before they're the ones who end up getting chewed instead. First off, we've gotta talk about their choice of weapons. Of course a good boomstick goes a long way, but as teenagers living in London, we have to take into consideration the types of offensive options that they'd actually have access to. Some bats and swords would have definitely done the trick if they were only facing off against more of those naked mole rat looking things. But now that the big boys are here, they're either going to need some stronger firepower or to use strategy to give them the best advantage in a fight. Although they're clearly bigger and stronger, we can still assume that they have similar sensory adaptations to the little one. This means that fireworks are still probably going to be their most useful tool for stunning or injuring them. Whenever one shows up, the key would be to quickly shoot off a firework in its direction, and then either attack it or start to get away while it's still disoriented. Speaking of being disoriented, this brings us to the alien's physical appearance. Unlike the pale naked one that we met the first time around, these are covered in jet black fur that absorbs nearly all light that hits it, making them almost invisible to the naked eye, especially here in the dark. This is going to make them even more difficult to fight because your brain is going to be working overtime 
time just trying to process what you're looking at, and you could easily be taken by surprise if you aren't careful. To counter this, the most basic thing that they can do is try to limit their encounters with these creatures to areas that are more well lit, like out on the city streets or near their apartment building. I'd also consider trying to find a strong flashlight to help me watch out for them in the dark, or even trying to splash them with brightly colored paint to make them easier to see. In contrast to their fur, their jaws seem to exhibit some form of natural bioluminescence. And although we don't know for sure why they've developed this adaptation, we can look at a few species found here on Earth to get some ideas. One common use of bioluminescence is for communication within a given species, as it's used for behaviors such as mating displays or signaling aggression. But without any eyes to see with, it's unlikely that their glowing jaws are meant to communicate with each other. Instead, they might be used for another survival strategy, luring or confusing their prey. Down in the darkest depths of the ocean, there is a horrifying family of creatures called dragonfish that are just about one of the closest things that we have to an actual alien life form here on Earth. Some species of dragonfish use their bioluminescent organs to produce flashes of light meant to startle and confuse whatever unlucky Nemo they're trying to eat. It's possible that these aliens are using a similar strategy here. For us, this means that the key to surviving an encounter with one is to avoid being distracted by the pretty lights while the rest of its nearly invisible body is closing the distance. Instead, try to keep your focus on the creature as a whole so that you can avoid being overwhelmed and torn apart faster than you can say, hello, govna. It doesn't help that these things are built like silverback gorillas, so whether you have weapons or not, the average person won't be that much of a threat to one in a fair fight. The best option if you happen to run into one is probably just to do what the kids are about to do now and get the hell out of there ASAP. They'll want to stick together at all costs, because not only is there safety in numbers, but providing the creature with multiple targets forces it to divide its attention instead of focusing in on one person, and gives you several other people to use as meat shields if things get really out of control. We've said it before and we'll say it again. You don't have to outrun the bear to get away, you just have to outrun the guy next to you. The sacrificial friend technique always comes in handy when you least expect it, and if I had to pick a guy out of this group to throw under the bus, sorry Biggs. But as the youngest and dorkiest member of the squad, you're the first one up on the chopping block. All things considered, they really should have just stayed up in Ron's apartment where it's safe and let the local authorities sort this mess out for themselves. But now, they've got a long way to go before they're back to the relative shelter of the block, and not all of them are going to make it there in one piece. Terrified, Moses and the boys immediately flee through the streets, desperately trying to get away from this abomination as quickly as they can. The aliens aren't the only ones out to get them though, because they're suddenly spotted by a police van carrying the woman Sam who they'd mugged earlier that night. While a few of the boys turn back onto the sidewalk, Moses takes a corner onto the street, attempting to distract them. But in the chaos, he ends up crashing his bike and is quickly detained by the officers. The other watch from an elevated walkway as Moses is cuffed and searched, but the alien has found them once again, and it's slowly making its way towards the police van without the others noticing, as another one appears on the rooftops and begins climbing down. Just as one of the officers loads Moses into the back and shuts the door, the aliens suddenly attack him and his partner, tearing both men to shreds and spraying the windows with their blood before they even realize what's going on. Terrified, Sam Sam climbs into the back of the vehicle as the two creatures pounce onto the roof, determined to get inside and take her and Moses out too. The thin walls of the police van won't hold much longer, but just then, Pest lights a huge firework and chucks it down the street below, where it comes to a stop directly under the van. Using his lights, smoke, and noise as a distraction, Dennis hops onto his scooter and speeds back down to the vehicle where Moses and Sam are still trapped. He's able to get inside just 
just as one of the aliens lunges after him, slamming the door in its face and setting Moses free just in time. Lucky for them, the officers left the keys in the ignition, so the boys quickly speed away with Sam still in the back seat, narrowly avoiding the aliens and telling the others to meet them at a nearby parking garage. Dennis floors it through the streets to their meeting point, but just as he turns the corner into the garage, they suddenly plow directly into Hi-Hats' car, completely destroying the front end of both vehicles. Thinking that he's just got into an accident with the police, Hi-Hats immediately starts to panic and tries to peel out of there, but his attitude completely changes when they realize who's really driving the van. The boys decide to let Sam go, but they still have Hi-Hats to deal with, and he is not happy. Stepping forward, Pest desperately tries to explain, insisting that this is all a misunderstanding, and that the aliens are still after them. But Hi-Hats refuses to hear them out, convinced that they must be trying to kill him and take control of the block for themselves. The argument nearly ends in a battle to the death, but just then, Hi-Hats sees one of the creatures drop down from the ceiling and hide behind his car. Still not convinced, he orders his henchmen to go check it out. But when he peeks around the trunk, the creature is no longer there. Suddenly, the alien lunges at him from the shadows just out of sight, pinning the man to the wall and biting his throat out before he even knows what hit him. Hi-Hats immediately opens fire, emptying his weapon into the creature and killing it as Moses and the others flee the scene. From the sound of things, there are more of them on the way, so he quickly jumps behind the wheel and reverses out of there before the reinforcements show up. Okay. Things keep going from bad to worse for Moses here. They're going to be in some major trouble now if they get caught, and that's only if they're lucky enough to not be killed by one of the aliens first. After what just went down in the parking garage, we know that even these larger aliens can be killed with standard weapons. And we also know that they're definitely not friendly. Not like there was really any question about that after what happened to poor little Pogo. As tough as these kids are, they can't take on an entire alien invasion by themselves. What they need now is a safe place to hide out while they wait for all of this to blow over, and I've got a few ideas. But first, let's take a look back at the attack on the police van for a moment. Now, it might have been safer for Moses if he'd told the officers right away when he saw the alien approaching the van, but if he was using it as a part of his escape strategy, then it definitely worked. Here, we see another example of fireworks being used to great effect as a distraction for the aliens. Going forward, they're going to want to use the fireworks during any encounter and always have one ready in case they need to make a quick escape. We also know that the creatures aren't strong enough to rip through the side of a police van very easily, seeing as how Dennis was able to hold one off by simply slamming the door before it could get in. They probably could have gotten through the glass, but seemed to lack the intelligence to test the structure for the best entrance point, preferring to take the most direct route to their target whenever they can. This means that the best shelter will have thick walls to hold them back, as well as limit their potential angles of attack. And there's at least one place in the city that the kids can go that covers both of these bases, back to Ron's apartment. Being at the top of the tower, this gives them the opportunity to set up traps and other defenses along the stairs and windows, since these are the only two directions that the aliens can come from. The hard part is going to be making it there without ending up as alien chow but Ron can help them out with that too. He's up there in the penthouse suite with binoculars and a clear view of the city for miles around. So the boys can use him as a lookout to tell them where the most alien activity is, what areas to avoid, and also warn them if he happens to see hi-hats, since now he wants them dead too. They'll want to lay low and avoid detection for as long as possible, but as soon as the aliens show up again, then the key is to hit them with the fireworks and don't stop running until they're back in the safety of the apartment building. If they happen to get cornered, then it's not impossible for them to take one down as long as they work together. But it won't be an easy battle by any means. So the best solution is to stay away from any fights from now on unless they really have no other choice. The boys regroup at a nearby garage where they're able to cut off Moses' handcuffs using a pair of bolt cutters. Thinking it over, Moses decides that their only option is to get back to their apartments and act like none of this ever happened. But with the aliens still roaming the streets, that is not going to be easy. They need some kind of transport, so they hop onto their bikes and scooters and begin racing back towards the block as fast as they can. The kids barely make it five minutes before the creatures show up and start chasing after them, forcing the boys to split up as they try to escape. 
Two of the boys, Jerome and Biggs, attempt to flee on foot up a staircase onto one of the raised footpaths, but an alien quickly cuts them off, scaring Jerome into tripping down the stairs before turning to follow Biggs instead. Cornered between the two of them, Biggs is forced to leap over the railing onto another flight of stairs, only narrowly managing to get away. But the creatures are still after him. Jumping onto the roof of a car, he gets back down to street level and takes shelter in an empty recycling dumpster, leaving him trapped with nowhere else to run, but at least he's safe for now. The rest of the boys make it to the building just as the creatures are closing in. Only Pest is still outside, and one of the aliens is hot on his heels. He makes it to the building just in time, but as they're holding the door shut, one of the creatures crashes through the glass and takes a nasty chomp out of his leg. Pest manages to fight it off with his bat, but he's badly injured. So the other boys drag him inside just as more of the aliens begin to break in. Carrying Pest through the halls, the boys end up running into who else but the woman, Sam, who's desperately trying to get into her own apartment. She's not trying to deal with these four again, but before she can lock the door, Moses rushes towards her and forces his way inside. The kids quickly lay Pest down on her couch as Sam retreats to her bedroom and comes out wielding a guitar, ready to defend herself. Seeing this, the boys only laugh her off, with Jerome explaining that they've got bigger things to worry about right now than fighting with each other. That's when Dennis remembers that Sam here is actually a nurse, but she's not exactly eager to help them out and says that even if she wanted to, Pest needs to be seen at a hospital before his wound becomes infected. Growing frustrated, Moses makes it clear that they're not asking, so with no other choice, Sam reluctantly agrees to see what she can do. Just then, everyone goes quiet as they hear the sound of something scratching at the apartment door. Moses grabs the bat and goes to take a look, only to see one of the aliens lunging at the peephole, violently trying to break its way in. Frightened, he quickly shuts the door and backs into the room, ready for a fight, but the creature suddenly blasts through the glass window and straight into the apartment's kitchen. While the rest of the group stand back terrified, Moses trades his bat for Dennis's samurai sword and leaps over the couch, stepping to the side as the alien tries to bite him and burying his blade into the top of its skull. In an instant, the creature collapses lifelessly to the ground, and Sam realizes with horror what they've been trying to tell her about the alien invasion is true. With the fight over, the others all gather around to have a good look at the body. Unlike the first one, this thing is the size of a human and covered in a thick layer of black fur so that it doesn't really reflect any light at all. While they're distracted, Sam tries to make a break for it once again, but stops in her tracks as she hears an army of the creatures shrieking from somewhere just out of sight, and regretfully decides that she'd rather stay with Moses and the boys instead. Dennis is not thrilled about picking up a useless passenger, but after thinking it over, Moses tells the woman to grab a weapon, allowing her to stick with the group for now. Okay, it looks like Moses just showed the rest of these punks how it's done. The only problem is that's just one alien down, and an entire meteor shower is worth left to go. They aren't going to get lucky to fight them one-on-one -on -one every time, so let's take a minute to break down this encounter and see what kind of strategies that we can come up with for the next one. If there's one thing that we can take away from this fight, it's that sword work, good when it comes to taking these freaks out. Dennis had two more of those back at the crib, so if they have the opportunity to pass by his apartment again, then they should quickly run inside and grab the extras if they can. After all, it never hurts to have a backup katana for when one katana just won't cut it. Also, I know that Pest was disoriented and he just almost lost his leg, but he missed a clear opportunity to use his fireworks to stun the alien here. Next time, they'll want to open the fight with some explosives. That way, they'll be able to land a critical shot without putting their lives in too much risk. For some reason, these creatures seem hell-bent on going after Moses and the boys instead of anyone else in the city, but why is that? That. Well, Jerome asked an important question when he wondered how the aliens could have found them here out of the 160 other doors on the block, and the answer to this might help explain what's going on. In the wild, predators often use nearly all of their senses when it comes to tracking prey. But in this case, there are a few senses that we can immediately rule out. First, no eyes means that the aliens aren't following them by vision. We already know that they rely heavily on their sense of hearing, but the answer probably isn't sound this time 
because there would be lots of other noises distracting them, meaning that there's no way that the aliens could pinpoint which vibrations in this entire giant building were coming from Moses and his friends in particular. This leaves us with only one other option, scent. Humans are smelly, but did you know that we each have our own unique scent? Just like your fingerprints, you have a special smell that belongs to you and only you. And there's a significant chance that this is how the aliens managed to pinpoint the group's location out of every room in the tower. If I had to guess, it's possible that this one picked up Pest's scent when it was chomping down on his leg back in the lobby. To counter this, I'd suggest that everyone quickly washes up and finds a fresh change of clothes. There's no guarantee that it'll work, but at least it's a start. Alternatively, they could try covering themselves in the smell of the dead one to see if that gets the other aliens off of their tail. With Sam's apartment no longer an option, the only thing left for Moses and the squad to do is grab whatever weapons that they can get their hands on and try to find another safe room somewhere higher up in the tower. It's time to arm up and maybe even build some shields out of stuff like cabinet doors, because it's up to them to keep themselves safe for now until the Men in Black or Master Chief finally step in to shut this invasion down. The boys lead the way upstairs to their friend Tia's apartment, hoping that her security gate and the extra numbers will keep them safe, at least for a little while. On their way up, they manage to get a call through to Biggs, who says that he's still trapped in the dumpster outside. With the aliens swarming the building, there's no way that they're going to be able to get to him yet, so they tell him to hold tight until they can figure out a new plan. Tia's friend answers the door, refusing to let them in since she can tell that there's clearly some kind of trouble afoot, but Tia cuts her off and tells the boys to get inside. While peeking out of the window, Pest realizes that the police activity outside is not as bad as you would probably expect for a countrywide alien invasion. Instead, it seems like the attacks must only be happening in the immediate surrounding area. Just then, Tia decides to have a look out the window for herself and immediately notices two of the creatures holding onto the side of the building right on the other side of the glass. In an instant, everyone panics as the aliens burst inside, taking cover in the back of the apartment as one of them pins Dennis to the floor. Moses tries to help his friend, but another alien quickly rushes in and cuts him off. And before anyone can save him, the alien tears Dennis's head off and sends it flying across the apartment, brutally killing him while the others can only watch. Now the creatures turn their attention towards Moses, who's outnumbered and pinned down, hiding behind the couch. Thinking quickly, Tia shatters a lamp and uses the exposed wire to zap one of the aliens, causing it to chase her back into the bedroom while the other stays to deal with Moses. Seeing his chance, he jumps up from behind the couch and raises his sword, but ends up getting it stuck in the wall as he holds it over his head. This looks like game over for Moses, but at the last second, Sam jumps in and stabs the creature straight through its lower jaw, killing the alien and saving his wife. Meanwhile, Tia and her friend are able to take the second one down with an ice skate, narrowly defeating it without any injury. For now, it looks like the fight is over, but it won't be long before another group of aliens tracks them down. Okay, damn, that's a tough break for Dennis. You'd think that if anyone would be safe, it would be the one guy who was actually wearing a helmet, but I guess not this time around. The worst part is that the poor kid might have lived too if his friends had only had his back. They could have all grouped up and attacked at once, or even thrown something to get the alien's attention. Anything to stop it from only focusing on him. But poor Dennis got decapitated before anyone else decided to step up, and if I were him, then my headless ghost would be pissed. Now, one thing to point out is that after they were done with Dennis, the aliens went specifically for Moses and not anyone else unless they directly attacked them first. This means that they're focused on Moses for some reason, and while they may not know why or how to fix it yet, this does give them the opportunity to use him as bait when they have to. Think about it this way, the aliens will always be interested in Moses first, so this gives everyone else the option of going in for one free kill shot just like Sam did. You just have to make it count and try to set the situation up so that you're fighting the aliens in a controlled way. This strategy combined with some fireworks could definitely do the trick if you have to take a few of them on. Say that a bunch of aliens swarm the room. By using a firework to stun them and then having everyone go in for their one free kill, they can potentially clear out entire rooms full of these freaks at one time. 
Still, you never want to go looking for a fight, but if one finds you, then it never hurts to use every advantage that you have to make sure as many people as possible make it out alive. Gathering around, the girls are quick to blame Moses for what happened, saying that the aliens must be going after him as revenge for killing the first one earlier that night. With more on the way, they're forced to run back into the hall, when all of a sudden, Hi-Hats shows up on the elevator and immediately starts blasting. The boys manage to escape just just as one of the aliens breaks down the door and chases Hi-Hats and his minions back to the elevator, with only Hi-Hats emerging alive as it finally comes to a stop. This kid Bruis here was just leaving, but before he can get far, Moses and the squad come up rushing in behind him. Instead of going down, they tell him that they need to go up, back to the only safe place for them in all of London right now. Ron's apartment. By the time that they reach the top floor, the hallway is dark and already full of aliens. So if they're going to reach Ron's apartment in one piece, then they'll need a plan. Taking cover, Pest fires off two more big-ass firecrackers, scaring the creatures off and filling the hallway with smoke. With the others following close behind, Moses leads the way, holding a Roman candle out to clear a path. But it isn't long before confusion takes over, and Jerome is attacked by one of the creatures after becoming lost in the fog. Hearing his screams, Pest rushes in to help, but it's too late, and Jerome is dragged to death just as Sam shows up and pulls Pest back out to safety. The survivors make it to Ron's apartment, thinking that they're finally safe. But as soon as they step inside, they find Hi-Hat already there waiting for them. Furious, he blames Moses for everything that's happened. But just when he's about to pull the trigger, they notice dozens of the creatures staring in at them through the window. Hi-Hats spins around to look for himself, giving the others a chance to escape into the safe room while he's distracted. And before he can do the same, the aliens swarm into the apartment, instantly tearing the man to shreds. Now that they're safe in the back room, Moses' regrets finally start to set in. With two of his friends dead, and an army of aliens at their doorstep. He's wishing that they just stayed home and played video games like Biggs had wanted to all along. Heartbroken, he finally apologizes to Sam for robbing her, saying that they never would have done it if he'd known that she lived here in the apartments, but she's still not quite ready to call it a truce. Just then, Moses steps into the UV lights to take another look at the creature that started this whole nightmare, when suddenly, Pest notices that his jacket is covered in some sort of a strange glowing substance. That's when Bruis here gets an idea. Thinking back to something that he learned in school, he theorizes that the substance might be some kind of mating pheromone, used by the female of the species to attract the males. When Moses killed it, he became covered in the chemical, which explains why the aliens seem to be specifically chasing after him, and ignoring almost everyone else who doesn't get in their way. Okay, man, the truth hurts, doesn't it? I guess now we know what got these aliens attention, and I hate to say it, but Moses, it looks like you f***ed up. We'll keep this one short and sweet, because I can tell that you're already getting the point here. They say that if you can't do the time, don't do the crime, but I don't think that anyone expected this to also apply to alien invasions. Well, I get the urge behind wanting to beat up that little golem looking freak, especially after what it did to your face. But now Jerome, Dennis, and even Pogo are all dead. And there's no denying that it's because of what you did. After a successful night of crime and nearly being killed by a falling space rock, you could have just called it a night and gone home. But you decided to start beef with an entire alien species, and your poor friends ended up being the ones who got caught in the crossfire. Now any of them will be lucky just to make it out of here alive, and they'll still have the police to deal with if they do. Look, I've gotta be honest. If I was one of your friends, then I would not be very happy with your ass right now, to say the least. I like you, Moses, but when you accidentally end up getting your friends involved in an alien turf war, there's only one thing to say. Moses, you f***ed up! As for strategy here, at least they now know what's attracting the aliens. Maybe they could just chunk the dead one out of the window really fast and hope that others follow it. But Moses here is about to come up with a plan that changes everything. Thinking it over, Moses realizes that this pheromone could be the answer to defeating the aliens, and now he has a plan. Since Sam hasn't been touched by the chemical, they decide to send her out first to turn on all of the gas in the apartment, with Moses planning to follow her and spring the trap once she's able to get a safe distance away. Nervous, Sam cautiously makes her way out into the living room, 
but now the entire place is swarming with aliens. But so far so good. She's able to make it down to Moses' apartment without any trouble and lets herself in. Speaking to her over the phone, Moses has her turn on the stove to fill the apartment with gas before getting out of the building as fast as she can. Once it's done, he grabs a sword and, with the dead female creature strapped to his backpack, begins to dash down to the lower floor. Using fireworks as a distraction, Moses leaps over the creatures and makes a break for the stairwell with the entire swarm of aliens only a few inches behind him. As soon as he reaches the apartment, he chucks the dead creature into the kitchen, backs himself up to the window, and uses one last firework to blow the entire place sky high, killing the aliens in a blaze and managing to survive by holding onto a flag hanging down from the balcony. Hearing the explosion, Pest, Bruce, and Ron come out of the apartment ready for a fight, but unfortunately for them, it's just the police. In the end, the boys are all arrested for their litany of crimes, except for Biggs, who managed to avoid being caught. The officers ask Sam to throw them under the bus, but she insists that Moses and the boys really saved her life. And from inside of the police van, Moses and Pest can hear the entire neighborhood chanting his name. No that he's the one who saved them from an alien invasion. They may not have gotten away with it, but the boys learned a valuable lesson. If you ever find an alien species at the park, let someone else handle it, and just go home to play some FIFA instead. Okay, bruv, what would you do? Personally, if I were just chilling with my homies and a bunch of like space gorillas came out of nowhere and just started f***ing up the block, you best believe I would be quick with the blick because I ain't letting no zombies no way take over my hood, you dig? Now having said all that, I want to give a special shout out to Scentbird for sponsoring today's video. You guys rock and you're the reason that I smell so good. <laughs> But let us know down in the comments what you would do, as always. Uh, thank you for watching, and if you want to see more videos just like this, look no further than the How to Beat playlist. I'll see you guys in the next video, and have a damn good day.